As the use of rivaroxaban increases in clinical practice for uh, DVT, what I'm asking you about is a basic understanding of its clinical impact in patient care on a day-in and day-out basis. And so towards that end, we're going to talk about the topic with Professor Alexander Turpy, who is an MD and a professor of medicine at McMaster University and Hamilton Health Sciences Center, uh, Hamilton, Ontario. And we're talking about Zalea, and it is a non-interventional study comparing rivaroxaban with standard anticoagulation. And it's published in Lancet Hematology. So the first thing I wanted to ask you about was the interesting creation of this particular study. It was. It's in response to a request made by the European Medicines Agency, correct? Well, that's correct. As you know, uh, uh, anticoagulant drugs, of which there are many new uh, agents, are being rigorously tested in randomized clinical trials. And uh, this really is the gold standard. Uh, uh, the randomization takes care of differences in patient characteristics and allows for a, a nice comparison between uh, the new treatment and the old standards. Uh, what we've seen is that uh, all of the new anticoagulant drugs are highly effective across the spectrum of thromboembolic disease. Uh, if we specifically look at rivaroxaban, which is one of the factor 10 inhibitors, it has been tested in VTE prevention and orthopedic surgery and the prevention of stroke and atrial fibrillation and for the treatment of deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism and for the long-term prevention of recurrence. So it has an approval in most countries, including the United States, for uh, use across that spectrum of thromboembolic disease. But we all know that uh, the randomized clinical trials are very rigid in their, yes. uh, in their inclusion criteria. They have very specific outcomes. They have pre-specified uh, statistical analyses which uh, uh, determine whether or not it's effective and whether uh, there is no excess of adverse uh, events. The question that we all want to know as doctors is, can I translate that information into clinical practice? Right. Uh, because we do know that the patients are different. We've got patients who've got concomitant illnesses of taking drugs that would exclude them from uh, participating in the clinical trials. Uh, so what we've done is we've set up a whole series of what we call post-interventional studies or post-approval uh, studies uh, to uh, determine whether or not we can translate that information into practice. Uh, River Oxman has had a very large ongoing program and have, has tested uh, in the post-interventional phase four studies uh, Rivaroxaban in VTE prevention in a study called Zamus, uh, stroke reduction in atrial fibrillation in a study called Xantus, and now uh, we have a new study called Zalia, uh, where we evaluated rivaroxaban in the setting of treatment of deep vein thrombosis. Now it's an interesting study, it was carried out in Europe, in Israel and in Canada, 19 uh, centers in, in Europe, and involved you know, more than 5,000 patients uh, who presented with deep vein thrombosis. Very interesting observation. Uh, uh, we, we started the study when the only approval was for DVT, deep vein thrombosis, and not for pulmonary embolism. During the conduct of the study, uh, pulmonary embolism was approved. Uh, so we changed the inclusion criteria to allow patients who had concomitant pulmonary embolism, and there were a few of them, uh, but the main inclusion criterion was uh, acute deep vein thrombosis. Uh, the patients were, the, the clinicians chose the treatment. It had to be either river oxidant in the approved dose of 20, uh, 15 milligrams twice a day for three weeks, followed by 20 milligrams once a day, or standard of care. Uh, now, in the randomized trials, that was enoxaparin followed by vitamin K antagonist, but we saw patients got either low molecular heparin, fondaparinux, followed by uh, vitamin K antagonists, and some patients got uh, low molecular heparin alone. As it turns out, uh, many of these patients had cancer-associated thrombosis. And so we had uh, all sorts of standard of care treatments, but we uh, had the specified uh, regimen of uh, rivaroxaban. Now that's interesting also because, um, as you may know, in the clinical trials, uh, they had to have confirmed diagnosis uh, 
yes. uh, of DVT and thus when the patient's presented to the investigator, uh, while the diagnosis is being confirmed, they, they usually or normally received an approved treatment, which of course was low molecular heparin. Uh, so in the DVT trial, 73% of the patients received low molecular heparin uh, prior to recruitment uh, into the study. Uh, but the approval for rivaroxaban was for rivaroxaban alone without requirement for parental anticoagulation. And what did we see in, this, in standard practice? What we saw was that almost 80% of the clinicians used a single drug approach. Only uh, a little fewer than 20% gave them a short period of low molecular heparin, and some gave them a bit longer. Uh, we called these patients early switchers and excluded them from the analysis, but it's interesting because they were a bit different from the patients who were in the river oxaban group or the standard of care group. Many of them had pulmonary embolism. It's not a surprise then that doctors yeah, right. would give them the parenteral drug. Many of them had cancer associated thrombosis. So they're a special group. So we had a, a very nice comparison of uh, 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 2,000-odd patients in river oxaban, uh, a similar number uh, in standard of care. And we looked at major bleeding, recurrent venous thromboembolism, and all-cause mortality. And one of the important things about this study it was it was prospective and we had independent adjudication of the endpoints, which is a very important uh, uh, methodological point with, with respect to the rigor uh, of our outcome assessment. Uh, so uh, when we looked at the data, uh, there were fewer events in the patients who received uh, river oxaban in comparison to the standard of care. For example, uh, there were 0.8 uh, patients uh, uh, <coughs> had a major bleed uh, with uh, rivaroxaban and 2.1 uh, uh, with uh, standard of care. Now, uh, these are the propensity adjusted uh, 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 figures. Uh, when, when we looked at the absolute figures, they were a bit higher, but not much. Uh, and you, you might say, well, that is quite a difference, but when you do a propensity adjustment of the hazard ratio, uh, you found that it's not a significant difference. But uh, I think that, when we, and we saw that with each one of the outcomes, uh, uh, major bleeding, venous thrombus, and all-cause mortality. But what we saw was that these events were very low uh, and uh, they were uh, consistent with, with what was seen in the randomized clinical trials. So we were confident uh, when uh, the study was completed that we can indeed translate what we saw in the clinical trials into clinical practice. Well, another interesting observation was that uh, when we looked at duration of hospitalization, some of the patients were hospitalized. It's interesting that uh, hospitalization patterns were quite different in, in some countries from others. And we're going to do further analysis of that. But when the patients were hospitalized, uh, the patients who received river oxaban had shorter hospitalization stays than the patients who were in the standard of care. Quite significant in unadjusted, but also in the adjusted data. So what does that tell us? Uh, well, I, mean, I think it's very easy. I think that uh, uh, patients who are on an anticoagulant that uh, requires monitoring, they tend to keep the patients in hospital longer. Okay. Uh, they were a bit different in their patient characteristics, but as I said, when we adjusted for uh, these characteristics, that difference remained. Now, that's obviously very important in oh, terms of, yes. of, of health care costs. It's going to reduce health care costs enormously, and also it's going to be much easier for the patients and much more practical. Well, that's what I was going to ask, is the patients must have been happy when they were on oh, the river oxabine arm. Absolutely, yes. Because it's got to be easier for them. So, so I think that what we've demonstrated in this uh, phase four non-interventional trials is that, yes, indeed, what we see in the clinical trials can be translated into practice, and we've got additional practical information, such as the shorter hospital stay, the lack of requirement for monitoring, and we'll be able to also look at uh, patient satisfaction. These are ongoing oh, evaluations. Okay. I was ask about that. Now, looking at patient characteristics, it seemed the treatment allocation may have been influenced a bit by patient age and comorbidities. So, could that have affected the outcomes that you received? Well, as I, as, I, as I indicated to you, there were differences, quite substantial differences, when you look at the raw data. Uh, 
the, the differences, the numeric differences uh, are still there, but they're somewhat less, but not much less. But the, uh, the propensity analysis taking into account right. uh, all of these differences, in fact, say that the comparison uh, of river oxaban uh, with standard of care uh, indicates that there's no difference. Well, I think it was after Einstein DDT, wasn't it, that the, uh, the European Medicines Agency was to ask you to put together <clears throat> something like this? Well, they, they wanted to, to ensure that uh, what was shown in the clinical trials could be right. uh, demonstrated in clinical practice, because they also know, of course, that the patients are different, and they wanted to be particularly certain about the safety, and we clearly demonstrated this. So anything else you want to do? Any other analysis that you think? Oh, well, there's lots of analysis. You know, the, uh, we want to look at these early switchers. I mean, they're a very interesting population. Why do doctors do that? Uh, yeah. uh, why do they give them longer periods of anticoagulation than uh, would be necessary, perhaps necessary, uh, based on what uh, some information we have. You know, we have uh, seen, as you pointed out, that the chose to give the younger patients, the patients with normal renal function, less cancer-associated thrombosis, fewer PEs, the, the, the less sick patients they tend to give right. the, the new anticoagulant to. Uh, but in fact, when you look at subsequent information from all of the randomized studies of these new anticoagulant drugs, they are the very patients who do well with the new anticoagulant drugs. So it's an opportunity for us to educate the medical community that indeed you do not have to uh, uh, give low-risk patients new treatments and high-risk patients old treatment. You can give them all. Uh, very effective treatment with the new agents. That's an important message. Yes. So this is being published in Lancet Hematology? Uh, yes, we're, we're, we'll present that tonight at the American Society of Hematology. And, uh, will be simultaneously published in, in Lancet Hematology. And we'll give you the uh, citation for that as soon as I say. This is Rick McGuire and we are at ASH 2015.